Okay, everybody, so we're going to go ahead and get started today. Um, so we'll do some brief introductions of our speakers and then run some really cool stuff. So um, I'm going to introduce Professor Blackman. He's a professor from South Texas College of Law. Um, he teaches numerous courses in constitutional law and property um, and property related courses. He's published over 30 articles, several books, and case supplements. He's written over 40 or had over 40 academic speaking engagements and over 200 presentations to groups like ours. Did you count? Years. Did you actually do a count? Yes, I did. Impressive. <laughs> Yet, none of you have seen the first two rows. You must be afraid of me. I don't, I don't know what this is. Yeah. Um, he's also provided uh, numerous, com made numerous uh, commentary presentations for major news sources like The Hill, LA Times, Washington Post, uh, New York Times, Heritage Foundation, both um, in print, on the radio, and on television. Um, prior to academics, he was a litigator. He argued before and wrote several briefs um, for several U.S. district courts. And he also completed two clerkships. He graduated from Penn State and George Mason Law. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Our second speaker today is Dennis Crouch, who you all easily identify as Professor Eric Mizzou. He is also the co-director of the Center of IP and Entrepreneurship. He is a leader in the IP field in the nation. Just overall, he, <laughs> <laughs> he writes a vastly popular law blog, Pat and Leo. And prior to academics, he was a patent attorney at McDowell, Bowen, Hubert, and Berthoff in Chicago and taught at Boston Law. He has worked on numerous cases involving various technologies in computer and software space, automotive technologies, lens design, bearings, <laughs> HVAC, and business methods. You name it, probably worked on them. Prior to law here, he was a technical consultant for manufacturing firms in New England, a research fellow at NASA, software developer at Mayo Clinic's biomedical imaging department, and a Peace Corps volunteer. He graduated with a BSc in mechanical engineering from Princeton and earned his law degree from the University of Chicago. So if you join us in welcoming our speakers today. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I highly recommend the Pat Leo blog. It is a must-read patent stuff. Whenever the Supreme Court gets it wrong, he is going to be on top of it. So my talk for today is a treat. Not just one constitutional right, two constitutional rights. And how 3D printed guns are protected by both the First and Second Amendments. As a preview, at the end of my talk, I'll be talking about 3D printing and IP, which is why my distinguished colleague uh, is joining us today to hopefully tell me why I'm wrong. So first of all, has anyone ever actually used a 3D printer? What have you made? Uh, a what? A so is that a Pokemon thing? <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I admit, I don't know what the hell this Pokemon stuff was, so this entire, I guess I'm too old for it. Uh, but 3D printing is a way, I think my clicker stopped working. <sighs> Perfect timing. 3D printing is a method of creating stuff on the computer and turning it into real life. You can create something as simple or as complicated as a house. As simple or as complicated as a car. And in the same fashion that you can draw something on a piece of paper, you can design an object on a computer. See if this works. Oh, I think my clicker's dead. So let's give you a brief tutorial of how 3D printing operates. It works on very basic principles of math. And I know you all went to law school, so you don't want to do math, but I promise this will be very, very simple. If I were to tell you that I want to draw a cylinder, a cylinder with a height of 20 inches and a radius of five inches. If I gave you a piece of clay, in theory at least, you can create an object with that shape and size. And that's exactly what this code does. Create a cylinder with a height of 20 and a radius of five. This is at basic level how 3D printing works. You tell a computer, this is the object I want to draw, here are the dimensions, here are the properties, and the computer then transforms that code, which is perfectly intelligible, you'll understand it in three seconds of instruction, transforms that code into an actual real life object. Now these objects can be something very simple, such as your little tchotchkes, your glasses, and whatever else. You can also make translucent plastic, these different gears. Or you can make something like a race car, like this. And it all comes out of a 3D printer. Now how does a 3D printer work? Very simply. It works in a very same fashion as making a candle. Has anyone ever made a candle before? Well, you know how this works. You take a wick, 
and you dip into the wax. You lift it up, you dip into the wax. Maybe dip into a different color wax for different consistency to make different shapes and sizes of candles. 3D printing operates in the exact same fashion. But instead of <coughs> dipping something into wax, you are spraying very thin layers of plastic using this sort of nozzle. And the way it works is you put a very thin base of plastic, then you put another base on top of that, and then another base on top of that, and to keep one on top of the other on top of the other, you actually make an object, in this case, a little ball. And what's actually going on is as the layers are being put on one top of the next, there's a heating component, which makes this sort of liquidy plastic solidify into an object. And I want to show you a demonstration how an object is actually being made, OK? I'm not going to tell you what this object is. You're going to have to guess. Because it's going to start with one layer, one layer, one layer. When you see what the object is, I want you to call it that, OK? Everyone get it? Good. So the first layer is a sort of honeycomb lattice, which is a very structurally strong uh, uh, mode. The bees know what they're doing. That's why honeycomb is such a very naturally strong um, uh, 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 substance. So you have one layer. We have a second layer, a third layer, and was it fourth layer? What is it? Another layer. And see it yet? What? <laughs> Come on, Missouri, you're killing me. Wait, is it a little character for those little feet? Okay, another layer. And see it yet? <laughs> what? Another layer. Come on, Missouri. It's a, it's a face. It's a face. Okay, good. Another <laughs> layer. Fro okay, frog. Close, close. Anyone see it yet? Further, close with frog. Ready? Another layer. Oh, you should people get it by now. Another layer. Yoda. Yoda. Who said it? Red shirt. Winner. Winner. Chicken dinner. It's Yoda from Star Wars. Yes. Okay. Everyone sees it now. Ah. There it is. Right? Once, once, once you get the eye, everything comes. Okay, now you see it. Now you see it. Okay. And you see you keep putting one layer on top of the other, on top of the other, on top of the other, and eventually you close off the head. Done. That's copyright and trademark. Oh, <laughs> I have so much in this presentation, you have no idea. You can create items. Actually, it's funny you mentioned, I will talk about the copyright aspect in about uh, 30, uh, maybe 20 minutes. But the ability to make this is so straightforward. I am not artistic, right? If you gave me a piece of clay and a million dollars, I could not make that. No matter what you paid me, I would not be able to replicate that. But I'll tell you what, I can make that design on a computer, and I can use a 3D printer to create what's in my head and render this into an actual, real-life, physical object. And 3D printing has gotten increasingly sophisticated. You can make objects that are pretty, pretty intricate. This, this interlocking gear system was made entirely with a 3D printer, which is very impressive if you actually think about the workings. But because we are in America, what do you think it was the first thing that people wanted to build with a 3D printer? Guns. Guns. God bless America, right? <laughs> this is what put 3D printing on the map. Guns. And not just any guns, but in particular, a gun known as the Liberator. Now. I'm going to show you a picture here. Does anyone know what this is? It's flashing. I'm sorry about that. Does anyone know what this is? Ooh. Well, that's something. Does anyone know what this picture is? I want to try and guess. It's flashing to give you a little, little incentives. Yeah, you want to call someone that one? Anyone want to try and guess what this is? Well, it's a cylinder, right? It's a cylinder. What do you think this is of a cylinder? Oh. Is it a chain? The barrel of a gun. The barrel of a gun. This is indeed the barrel of the Liberator handgun. And remember at the outset I told you how to make a cylinder using 3D prints? Remember the, the, the height and the radius? The exact code I gave you to make a harmless cylinder can also be used to create the barrel of a gun. This is where, I hope this works. Yes. This is where Cody Wilson comes into the picture. Cody was a third year, I'm sorry, first year law student at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, he never finished his 1L year. 
Instead, he decided to, if you can see the little computer in the background, develop a gun to be printed using a computer. You see, Cody is something of an anarchist, and a self-admitted one is that. Uh, he has a very low view of government in general, uh, but very strong view of the Second Amendment. Uh, I should note at the outset that, in fact, I work for Cody. Uh, uh, a number of years ago, I wrote an article about 3D printed guns and the first and second amendment. Uh, one day I get an email out of the blue from Cody saying, hey, I'd like to hire you. Huh? I'd like to hire you to represent me when I sue the government. Like, tell me more. Um, so Cody, uh, as we'll talk about later, uh, uh, actually tried putting blueprints for his gun on the internet, and the government said take them down. And we are currently involved in litigation to vindicate his constitutional rights, but let's talk about how Cody got there. One of the first items that Cody designed is this piece of plastic. Does anyone know what this is? Okay. Now, <laughs> what's in it with your food in the mouth? What's an AR-15 lower receiver? Yeah, in the back, right there. It's the uh, registered piece of AR-15 that the government considers a gun. And he gave me the exact right answer. Usually people say the AR-15 is what makes the gun work, right? These are the guts of the gun, right? This is the frame that holds an AR-15 together, but the guy said the right thing. It's the registered part. This is the only part of the gun the government cares about. Everything else, the scary looking stuff, you can buy that in the store without any registration. The wrinkle. If you make your own AR-15 lower receiver, government has no knowledge about it. So even today under federal law, you can make your own receiver. Now for most people, it's hard. You have to get a piece of metal, you have to drill it, make different holes in it. You know, look at this. That's probably hard to machine. But Cody found a way using a 3D printer to create a fully functional AR-15 receiver. Thousands. Thousands. Indeed, you can see him here. He built a fully functional AR-15, and this thing goes for thousands of rounds. Yeah. You state the concern is that it's unregistered and they can pretty print it, but what's the difference between that and using a 9 access mill? Actually, not much. And indeed, it's an argument we made in court. You can legally make your own firearm AR-15 uh, low receiver using any means you want. This is simply an easier way of doing it, but it can handle thousands of rounds uh, uh, and it still hasn't burned out. Um, the next thing that Cody designed is that white thing over there, which is a magazine. He was able to make a fully functional magazine for an AR-15. Um, he called it the Cuomo after the governor of New York was attempted to ban these, as it were. And again, the magazine was able to hold uh, go through thousands of rounds. It's still fully functional. The springs, everything, everything's with it. Yeah, I think it's flickering. I, I don't know what's up with that. The show must go on. But what really put Cody on the map, what really put Cody on the map was this. What the heck is this? These little squiggles, right? These little, these little lines. What is this? These are the parts of a fully functional Handgun, that little round thing at the bottom, that is the barrel, that barrel I showed you before. Everything on this screen is printed with a 3D gun with the exception of the little bullet, which is that little copper thing, and the nail. The nail is used as a firing pin, and the bullet, ooh, there it goes, and the bullet is otherwise, okay? So what happens with this gun? Very simply, turn it off. Turn back on, here we go. Very simply, Cody made all the parts. Now, this is when the gun first came out. And it seems like there's a big rope there in the corner, okay? The reason why there was a rope, and this is the gentleman's question before, is at first he was afraid to pull the trigger himself. Why? Because he could blow up in his hand. So what Cody did to begin was he put the trigger on it, take a rope, and stand maybe 10 feet away, and yank it. But eventually, after a number of trials, he perfected it, and the gun became fully functional. You have to do things like, for example, uh, coat the barrel in this bath of like vinegar and acetone and let it solidify so that way it can handle the recoil and the, and the pressure from the combustion. But eventually Cody made it. He was willing to fire it himself. And he broke the first rule of firearm safety. Don't point the gun at anyone. Uh, but for the photo op, I suppose he was willing to do so. All right. So is there a problem? Did Cody break? Any laws? <laughs> is there any problem with making a gun by yourself on your computer? When I discuss 3D printed guns, this is the image that people have in their minds, right? That you press a button and a fully functional handgun you know, pops out, ready to fire. 
Um, and this is simply um, not the case. This is not <laughs> how 3D printed guns work. Let's see if it comes back on. Indeed, for many years, people have been able to make their own handguns. Does anyone know what a zip gun is? Anyone ever make a zip gun? Oh, people are shaking you. You're all good people. Um, a zip gun is a handmade firearm that you can make at home from parts lying around the house. And if this turns out in a second, I'll show you what one looks like. Uh -huh. Anyway, so if you were to take a garden hose and a soldering iron, a garden hose and a soldering iron, and you take the little nozzle off the hose and put it on the tip of the soldering iron, you've just made a fully functional handgun. Perfectly legal. Under federal law, you can make a gun at home using parts you can find. Ah, there it is. Thank you. Under federal law, you can make a gun at home using parts at the hardware store. They can buy for, oh, it's turned off. <laughs> the challenges of presenting are always, are always innate. You can get a fully functional handgun using parts from the grocery store for five bucks. Fully legal. No problem with that. Unless it's automatic or something else, but a single shot gun, you're on your own. Ah, oh, there it is. Let's see the next one. Ooh, so close. <laughs> Let's see if we can get this one. Keep going. It's a 30 second round of presentation. You can also make a firearm out of a little keychain. Those little flash like keychains that you can buy at the store for five bucks, you can make them into a gun. How? A gun is a very simple item. What you have is a bullet, which has some gunpowder in it, and something sharp. And if you pierce the back, oh, that's it, that's a little flashlight keychain. And if you pierce the back of a bullet, it goes flying. Now I want to show you a video. Hopefully this one works all the way through. Do not try this at home. Do not try this at home. These guys are idiots. Do not try this at home. They are making a rifle out of a metal pipe, which is in his one hand, and a rubber tube, which is in the other hand. What are they going to do? On the tip of this metal pipe is a little dimple. They're used as a firing pin. And they're going to jam that metal pipe into the back of a shotgun shell. So watch. They load a shotgun shell into this rubber tube. Okay. Now, can anyone see what's wrong in this picture about where they're firing? Inside. Well, okay. They're firing inside, but it's actually even worse than that, as if that's not dumb enough. What do you see behind the box they're firing into? Anyone see it? The electrical wire. See, there's an outlet. There's like a yellow wire running down the side. So these morons, I'll show this, this other picture is a better, are about to fire into an electrical outlet, right? So again, they put the shotgun shell in, they're gonna load the pipe up, what is gonna happen, ready? Ready guys? Three, two, one, boom! Oh. Exactly, <laughs> exactly, my reaction precisely. And they made yet another hole in their box. Now, look at them, they're so proud, they're a smoking gun shell, right? Look how proud they are, taking selfies and everything, right? Why am I showing you the picture of these idiots, the, the shell spent? Why am I showing you these pictures? Because it's really easy to make a gun. Really, really easy to make a gun. You don't need a computer. You don't need, you don't need a 3D printer. You don't need, like, AutoCAD. You need a piece of metal, a pipe, and a shotgun shell you can buy for about maybe 50 cents, right? And from our good friends at the Division of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, our favorite convenience store, this is perfectly lawful. So long as a gun doesn't enter into state commerce, that is you're not selling it, using it for your own consumption, the feds have no interest in your homemade guns. And uh, this is not Josh talking. Go to the ATF website, there's an FAQ, and makes this point very clearly. I think we're good with the video. Thank you so much. So far, so good. Um, so where does this leave us? Why then did Cody to go hire a lawyer if what he did was perfectly lawful? So here's the rub, guys. Making the gun is not the problem. The problem arose because Cody put the files used to make the gun on the internet. Cody put on the internet the design files for the Liberator. About a month or two after he put these files online, at which point they've been downloaded hundreds of thousands of times. He got a letter from the State Department. The State Department, you ask? The State Department. And they said, Mr. Wilson, we've, we've, we've learned that you've put these files on the internet. 
You are now engaged in the illegal export of arms. That sharing a file on the web is, in the government's view now, exporting arms. You can imagine this came as something of a surprise to Cody, because he'd never heard of these laws. No such law actually exists. But he never heard of such a such, such regime. Cody, as a good client should, took the files down. Number one rule, the government says to do something, do it and then sue, right? Don't break the law and try and defend yourself in criminal action, right? right? Don't make the email server in the first place, don't be honest. But if you do, <laughs> oh, too soon, right? Try to do a facial challenge. Don't try and defend yourself in court. You're going to lose unless whatever. So what are the main defenses for Cody? The first one he's not going from is the First Amendment of the Constitution, right? The First <laughs> Amendment, as you all know, places restrictions on the government. They cannot impose a prior restraint on speech. They cannot say, Josh, shut up. Josh, don't give this talk. Josh, don't do that. Josh, don't say this, right? The government cannot impose a prior restraint of speech unless they got a super duper 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 good reason and basically the Supreme Court said no reason's good enough. So in theory they could perhaps justify a prior restraint, but these things, these things simply really don't fly. But you may ask, wait a minute, Josh, this is not just speech. This is speech about to make a gun, and guns are bad, and, and, and they're dangerous, and they kill people, and they could use to harm people. Um, I, I think back to a book which maybe some of you are familiar with called The Anarchist Cookbook. Anyone know about this book? It's basically a terrorist hand guide, right? Long before there was Al-Qaeda, there was the Weather Underground, right, back in the 60s. Uh, these were domestic terrorists. Uh, uh, they were probably protesting the Quad at some point <laughs> some decades ago. Uh, but these were domestic terrorists, and they were trying to engage in acts of mischief. In bookstores that would teach you how to make bombs, how to make poison, how to do different things that are really, really dangerous. Uh, governments tried to take this book off the shelves and said, you can't sell this book, it's dangerous. And the courts consistently held, no, no, no. The mere fact that you can use a book to learn how to do something bad, still protected, right? You can have a manual teaching how to make a rifle, a manual teaching how to make a sharpshooting gun to save your target shooter. Uh, uh, these are all things protected by the Constitution. You say, wait a minute, Josh, this isn't a book we're talking about. Uh, this is code, um, information speech. And particularly the kind of information at issue here. This is not some sort of machine language, right? You know, zeros and ones uh, uh, that, that, that would be incomprehensible to a human. Um, this is designed in <laughs> pictures and uh, words. And I showed all of you in a matter of three seconds how 3D printing code works. Um, and courts have held that this is, this is not some sort of functional speech. This is actually an expressive type of code. You're simply expressing yourself on a, uh, a computer rather than a piece of paper. And the Supreme Court, in a case called Sorrell v. INS Health, held that the creation and dissemination, not just the creation, but the creation and dissemination of information are speech. We live in a world governed by code. And the Supreme Court, fortunately, has been very protective of the manner in which code gets its expression. Like we're all in the matrix of Neo, right? The world is nothing but code. But, excuse me, this is not only a matter of the First Amendment. It's also implicating the Second Amendment. Um, as you all know, or you should know, uh, the Second Amendment says a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep their arms shall not be infringed. And in a 2008 case called District of Columbia v. Heller, the court finally gave meaning to that provision at long last. And they held that the Second Amendment guarantees an individual right to keep and bear arms. And two years later, in a case called McDonald v. City of Chicago, uh, the court incorporated the Second Amendment. And they held that not only can the federal government not ban guns, the states and the cities can no longer ban guns. And this is actually a picture of Heller and McDonald together. But after that, the Supreme Court went silent. And they haven't granted certiorari in a Second Amendment case since McDonald. Now with Justice Scalia gone, the prospects don't look too uh, 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 bright for the future of the Second Amendment, but that's neither here nor there. Um, what I'd like to discuss is two aspects of the Second Amendment that I think are important. The courts only address the right to bear arms as a right to keep a gun in your home. They haven't addressed the right to carry or anything else. I'm going more fundamental. I'm going to argue, and I think there's good, good reason here, that the Second Amendment embraces the right to acquire arms. Now, I am not saying, and please make no mistake, 
that anyone can buy a gun under any circumstance for any reason. That's not my argument. My argument, to the contrary, is that the Second Amendment prohibits banning the acquisition of arms. Because imagine you had a case like this, right? Supreme Court says you have the right to own a gun. Great, government bans the sale of guns. Well, that doesn't, doesn't get you very far. <laughs> The point is that the actual sale of guns has to have some constitutional scrutiny to it. Whatever it is, we can argue later. Uh, because indeed, Dick Keller actually had a gun from before a Supreme Court case. He had it from the 70s. He was required to keep this lock on at all times. Uh, it's a funny story, but if you were to take this lock off for one minute, even if a guy is breaking into his house, he'll be breaking the law. There's no self-defense exception. Uh, but after the case, he was able to get a license to go acquire a new gun. So part of the Second Amendment is actually acquiring the thing you use to bear. The second aspect, which I think I'm on much stronger ground arguing, is the right to make your own arms. Long before there was Walmart or Cabela's or Dick's, if you wanted a gun, you had to make it yourself. And at the time of the American Revolution, you had the Minutemen who had to come with their own arms. They had to basically bear their own arms. That was the, that was the, the significance. Uh, if, anyone, if anyone's ever seen the John Adams miniseries, there's this great scene where Abigail Adams is pouring lead and making musket balls for uh, uh, the, the, the militiamen uh, in Massachusetts. Um, we have a very long-standing tradition of making your own guns for self-defense. And that's, I think, even closer to the core of the Second Amendment. Uh, uh, to the point, even today, the feds place no restrictions on homemade guns. That even the federal government today recognizes how important it is to guarantee this right to bear arms uh, and to make it for yourself. But wait, there's more, my friends. It's not only the First Amendment, it's not only the Second Amendment, but it's both amendments working in tandem as what I call a hybrid right. Um, the court has discussed this notion of hybrid rights in cases like Employment Division v. Smith and elsewhere, when one right reinforces the other. So I'll give you an easy example. Let's say the government actually tries to wage a war on Christmas, right? Let's say the government passes a law saying it's illegal to say Merry Christmas. Is that violation of free speech or violation of free exercise or both? I'll give you another example. Let's say the government passed a law saying we are banning the sale of books that happen from abortions. Is that violation of the First Amendment's free speech or a violation of the 14th Amendment? You see, when they ban you from saying something about another right, it's even worse, right? It's not that they're just banning the right itself, they're banning you from even speaking about that right. Here we have the case where Cody is trying to share information about how to make a gun. They're restricting his Second Amendment <coughs> right and his First Amendment right together by imposing a prior restraint on how to exercise your Bill of Rights liberties. All right, so I've talked about the Constitution. What laws actually exist now that protect the freedom of speech freedom of, uh, and the right to bear arms? Well, there's one law on the books called the Undetectable Firearms Act. It was passed in 1988. And what it says is that if you have a gun, it must have enough metal in it to trigger a magnetometer, like, you know, the extra machine uh, at, the, uh, at the airport that will, you know, beep, 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 if you walk through it. Why do we have this law from 1988? This was long for Cody Wilson, because of the Glock handguns. Everyone know what a Glock handgun is? Okay, the Glock's a very popular handgun. And it became very, very well known in the 1980s because of Bruce Willis in the greatest Christmas movie of all time, Die Hard. Uh, uh, Bruce Willis has this great line about the Glock handgun. He says, I can't do justice, but I'll do my best. Luggage, that punk pulled the Glock 7 on me. You know what that is? It's a porcelain gun made in Germany. It doesn't show up on your airport x-ray machines, and it costs more than what you make in a month. Everything he said is false, every word, okay? There is no, there is no Glock 7. It's not made of porcelain, it's made of metal. It's not made in Germany, it's made in Austria. It will show up in an airport x-ray machine, and they're fairly affordable. So everything he said was false. Yet, Congress freaked out because of a movie, and they passed a law banning a non-existent problem. Okay. Little do they know that, you know, the, almost 30 years later, uh, you would be able to have a, well, not porcelain, but a, a, a fully functional plastic gun. Now, to answer your question, how come the Liberator doesn't violate this act? It has a piece of metal that is soldered into the handle. And I'm gonna answer your follow-up question. Does it work if you remove the metal? Yes, it does. Uh, uh, 
But, and this is a very important point to make, lots of guns, if modified, become illegal. You can buy a shotgun and saw off the barrel. You turn a legal gun into an illegal gun. You can buy an Air 15 and file down the receiver and make it full automatic. Illegal. There are lots of ways you need a legal design and make it legal, uh, and the manufacturer are not held liable. So this is not problematic. But as designed, the Liberator does have this block of metal in it. So it does not violate this law. But since the Liberator came out, there were various movements afoot to try to uh, get rid of them. Indeed, Cody made uh, Senator Schumer's billboard of the day where Senator Schumer stands next to things he wants to ban. He does this very often. Uh, this he wants to ban the 3D printing gun. Cody was very proud of this. Um, that bill went nowhere. So some other proposals, right? How do we deal with this 3D gun problem? Well, maybe we can ban the material. Like, let's like ban the plastic using 3D printer. Um, this is a foolish idea for a number of reasons because it will limit creativity. But even worse, guess what, guys? You can 3D print metal, like Terminator style, right? You can 3D print metal. This is a 1911 handgun made in a shop in Austin. Not Cody, it's a different shop. I held it in my hand, feels good, weight's good, balance good, fires like a charm. Uh, so even if you ban plastic, you can make this gun out of some other material. But this gun costs about $40,000 to make. Not the best use of money, but it worked. Uh, another proposal, let's ban gunpowder. Okay, that's not going anywhere either. Um, the proposal I think is most likely to actually plant on the technology, Professor Crouch uh, <laughs> may, may, may have, the, uh, may, may have a, a nice re rejoinder, uh, is involving IP, intellectual property. Now, many of you probably know what DRM stands for. It stands for Digital Rights Management. It used to be that when you would buy a song on the iTunes bookstore, uh, you, know, you would not actually own the song. You're only getting what's called a license to the song. And that license is purely revocable. They can take it away from you at any time. Why? Because you know you had a, a Metallica and there other bands protesting against Napster saying, people are downloading music for free. Uh, we're going to go out of business. We can't make music. Uh, DRM is not limited to music. It also even applies to books. Uh, believe it or not, if you buy an Amazon Kindle book, right? You probably have Kindle books. You don't own the book. You only have a license to it. And there was actually a crazy story a couple of years ago where if you purchased a book in 1984, right, George Orwell's 1984 on your Kindle, you woke up one morning and the book was gone. Huh? There was a dispute between Amazon and the publisher, so they remotely deleted the book from your device. Yeah, 1984 of all books. This stuff happens. But the fear, the fear of producers is what 3D printing will do. Why? It's one thing to download a movie or a song or a book on a 3D printer. That's like about a few dollars. But imagine if you can download in a 3D printer the designs of the new LeBron James sneakers or the new pair of Air Jordans. And you can print them in your garage for about four or five bucks. So instead of giving Nike $200, you can spend $5 on materials and make your own sneakers. They look exactly the same. They fit your foot perfectly. You know, it'd be an amazing shoe with all the Nike whatever. Manufacturers are petrified of this proposition. Um, and look no further than Kanye West, uh, who recently said, this is a verbatim quote, uh, I'm afraid of 3D printing uh, because the internet destroyed the music industry. Uh, how is this? Uh, now it's what we're afraid of in the textile industry. People won't, won't buy stuff anymore if they can print it at home. This is where I think we may get something about guns and a little of economics. You know about the Baptist and Bootlegger coalitions? You went to Chicago, so I know you're, you're nodding. Um, the Baptist and bootlegger is a concept in economics, right? Who favors prohibition? You have two groups. You have the Baptists. They have good intentions. They want to stop alcohol to save our souls from eternal damnation, or whatever else, right? And who else loves prohibition? The bootleggers. <laughs> they love prohibition. Why? Because they can charge money for their moonshine and their speakeasies. They want to live in a dry county. Do they have those here? You know, dry counties? Okay, they have them in Texas where I live. And always, when you have a dry county at the border, what's it going to be? A liquor store. Why? Because they get all the money. Now, the flip question is why is there still a dry county? Because of that liquor store. They are lobbying to keep the dry laws in place so they have a monopoly on the sale of alcohol in that area. Trust me, this one is how it works. So, what does this mean for 3D guns, right? You're going to have your Baptists. You're going to have your Baptists. Right? You can have people who say, 
we need to ban guns because they're bad and we can't have 3D printed guns is dangerous. Then you have your people with a selfish motive. You have the manufacturers say, yeah, let's ban guns and let's also, while we're at it, ban people from printing sneakers. How will this work? Has anyone ever tried making a copy of a piece of US currency, like a $100 bill on a, on a high quality copy machine? Has anyone ever tried? You were all good souls. If you have, it would not work. It actually spits out an error message saying, no. The US Secret Service, which runs uh, counterfeiting operations, has worked with Canon and Xerox, that says if you try and print out a piece of currency, it spits out an error message, will not work. Maybe they'll even call the feds, I don't know. Uh, but, but, but you know, at least it, it, won't, it won't make you the copy. Imagine a similar situation, right? You try and print out a gun on your 3D printer, eh, eh, eh. government filter says, no, you cannot do this. And oh, by the way, you try and print out a pair of Nike sneakers, eh, 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 error message. Ah, so you see how this works, right? This gun thing can be used as a, as a camel's nose in the tent, so to speak, to <laughs> pave the way for putting filters on 3D printers. That if we're gonna you know, limit guns, why don't we also link up to the USPTO and if there's some sort of copyright or trademark, something similar, we just shut it down. You're already seeing this where Comcast and other groups are trying to filter your downloads. That if you try and download you know, a new <laughs> NBC Universal movie on your Comcast, ISP, they may block it because they're all conglomerate all together. But you may see a similar function. We try and print something that's similar to a patent or a copyright or a trademark that's held by some group. Okay. I want to finish my last minute to talk about export controls. Because this is actually what they got Cody for. Um, there's no prosecution. Indeed, they sent him a letter saying that you are not compliant with ITAR, the International Traffic and Arms Regulations. Okay. What is ITAR? It's a series of guidelines that were basically created during the Cold War uh, to prevent people from shipping arms to the third world of the Soviet Union, which, which you know, made sense. But they've interpreted this uh, statute in a very capacious fashion, um, such that it actually applies not just to the arms itself, but also information about the arms, um, what's called technical data. And for years, the Justice Department said, well, we can't apply this to pure speech because that would be unconstitutional. Um, and for decades, the DOJ held this position until Cody. So what happened to Cody? In 2013, I'm sorry, I went too far ahead. In 2013, he got this letter and says, uh, Dear Mr. Wilson, we, we, we found that you put these files on the internet. Guess what? You're not complying with ITAR. And one more. We want you to take down of the internet this Liberator pistol. Now, there is no pistol on the internet, right? He didn't take the gun and shove it into his router, right? He didn't shove it into his USB port. What he put on the web is information on how to create these devices. So the government said, these files should be removed from public access immediately. Ooh, almost to the end, so close. <laughs> immediately, that means right away. Cody indeed did take them down, but we filed suit um, uh, 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 in the federal district court in Texas about a year ago. Ah, came back up. Um, uh, the district court ruled against us, denied a preliminary injunction. We appealed to the Fifth Circuit. Um, a divided panel of the Fifth Circuit uh, ruled against us on very narrow ground. They said we didn't satisfy the standard for PI. Uh, we will have a filing very soon, and you'll hear more about this case uh, in the news. But this case is far from over. Why? Oh, this is killing my punchline. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I can't. You want to know why? Because it violates this. U.S. Constitution. I think there are serious problems with it. So I'm going to stop now. I'm going to sit down and let my good friend who's been taking four pages of notes. Something else you got? You got a lot of notes. <laughs> ah, boy, there we go. Thank you so much. Great. Uh, so uh, I only have a I have a few comments here, and I actually think this is a super interesting case. And next year, if you take my internet law class, we'll talk more about it. Uh, and perhaps you can, uh, you can write your own paper explaining why Professor B is wrong or, or maybe right. Uh, and so, uh, so a few things. Uh, I mean, so number one, when I think about this, I think about it as, right, we're talking about blueprints here. Uh, for uh, for creating items, but but they're even stronger in my view than blueprints in that um, right in, in that you're right these are instructions that you're giving to a machine to carry out. Now certainly right in the current state at the very end you can't just put 
push print and you get a, a firearm right out right away. Uh, but, um, but we're actually getting closer to that, uh, closer to that approach. Uh, and, um, and so I think I'll, so I'll start number one and talk a little bit about the ITAR front. And then I'll talk, uh, and then a little bit about the hybrid First and Second Amendment argument. Uh, and then I'll stop and we'll open it up for more discussions and, and questions of this interesting topic. Uh, now, so, so uh, we have, uh, we know in Heller uh, that, uh, that the Supreme Court did, um, right, it, it, in many ways is a big win for, uh, for gun owners giving folks, right, ensuring this right to, uh, to carry guns. But, but there were a number of important limitations in that opinion. Uh, and uh, at which Josh referred, alluded to lightly, uh, but uh, including those limitations essentially say that our longstanding principles limiting ownership of things like uh, unusually, unusual or dangerous uh, weapons, uh, are, are, right, those can still be in place. Uh, and, and I would expect that, uh, although the court didn't expressly say this, I would expect that the court uh, would also say that our long-standing limits on the export of, uh, of firearms to other countries uh, would equally be a, a kind of first, would, would be a principle that is not protected by, uh, by the Second Amendment. Uh, and, and so then that falls into this category. So, uh, so sure, you can't export guns to, uh, to Iran, but can you just post plans on the internet that give Iran, uh, folks in Iran or, or, or countries all around the world, um, uh, the blueprints that tell their machines exactly how to print these, uh, print these firearms. And, and my understanding is that's the, right, that's the problem that the State Department has here uh, with, what, with what Cody's doing. And, and it's basically the problem that we deal with in our internet law class every day uh, in that we have national laws that say what you can and can't do within your country. Uh, but the problem is the internet is working on a global basis. And there's really not a very good mechanism uh, if Cody wanted to put this on the internet but limit it just to Americans. And in particular, my understanding is the State Department would not want it just to be limited to people in America, but limited only to American citizens. Uh, and there's no kind of American citizen test when you're getting on the internet that Cody could use to figure out who I can distribute this to and who I can't. And so it is, right, it is a difficult uh, position that, that, was, that has, I think, been created by this, this wonderful thing we call the internet, and we're still muddling through it. Uh, and, and, um, right, and, and Josh's idea about DRM is uh, right, absolutely happening in a lot of areas to limit what individual users can do with their devices uh, and with their access to the internet. Uh, and so I would certainly expect that to come into play, especially, uh, especially right, essentially, uh, if a 3D printer manufacturer puts that into play, what they'll be able to do is limit their own liability for contributory infringement. Uh, and, and right, and companies like to limit their liability, so they'll likely do that. Uh, but right, even further though, uh, this right, this type of situation pushes us more towards right. One solution is to then put further boundaries up in the internet to say, okay, well, we that, right to make this work. What we need is a test when somebody gets on the internet to know whether or not they're in America and are an American citizen. Uh, and right, and then that's that's our approach, adding that kind of layer onto our use of the internet. Uh, and we're certainly heading in that direction also with many new uh, new elements of internet technology that are largely driven by largely driven by copyright law. Uh, and, and so uh, right, and for me, that's a problematic area uh, that um, uh, that we're we're working through. And I don't have a solution for that. I want to set that to the side and. And and push back. I, I want to push back pretty hard against Josh's idea that if you're violating both, right? That that if you have both a first and second amendment claim, that somehow there's like a hybrid that it that you that you have an extra high constitutional challenge. Uh, and right. And although I'm not right, I certainly don't know um, uh, second amendment law very well at all. Although we have uh, Professor Royce Barondis here, who's who is our. Uh, our local expert uh, and uh, all right with uh, 
in, in copyright law, we actually had a similar issue arise a few years ago. And if you just imagine that, uh, that I want to start printing out and distributing a copy, copy of, of one of Josh's books, uh, that would be a violation of this copyright, most likely. But I have a few arguments. Number one, the copyright law provides, uh, uh, provides a strong fair use defense. Uh, and there's a set of statute, a set of factors that the courts uh, and Congress have established for what is and isn't fair use. And so I may well have a fair use defense, right? I may also have, uh, right, it may also seem like I have a First Amendment free speech defense. Uh, where I say, look, I want to, I want to distribute this because, right, I'm running for office, and his, right, his writing is, is the kind of thing that um, uh, that I want to give to my uh, my supporters, et cetera. And so, the state, the courts, right, the government can't stop me from speaking by distributing these copies. And so that looks very much like a First Amendment defense I would raise. Uh, in, in the recent case of Golan v. Holder, the Supreme Court addressed this very issue. Uh, and um, and, uh, and they, they did it in an interesting way. They, they said, no, we don't, there's no kind of hybrid double layering on of here. Uh, and, and they even went further, actually, in Golan. They said, and in fact, um, you can't even raise the First Amendment defense in this copyright scenario. Rather, they said the way the way that our, our constitutionally protected copyright law works is that is that if you want to publish somebody else's work, you can do so under the First Amendment and uh, excuse me under the fair use defense, and that acts as a quasi First Amendment defense. And uh, and so we are just going to do one analysis called fair use, uh, and, and First Amendment will be left to the wayside. Uh, and, and so that's kind of right. And so the point being here, right? The, the point, if we bring that in to kind of Josh's construct, uh, right? We may well see the court um, saying, "Look, if if your argument is about gun rights, um, then um, uh, then let's look at the contours of the gun right law, and either you have a good defense there or you don't." Um, otherwise, right, alternatively, it may be that your argument is simply a speech argument, uh, and, and we'll look there or we won't, uh, but, but it certainly doesn't make sense, at least from that framework, uh, that, uh, that we pile these on. Now, right, admittedly, the problem with this side, with the Golan case, is that's one case, uh, and uh, the fun thing I'm sure you've learned in con law uh, is that it's a, it's a whole grab bag of mix, and so you can point to other cases going, right, where we do a little bit of piling on, and other cases where we separate it out. Uh, and so it's certainly unclear how our Supreme Court, I think, would come out in this question. Hopefully, right, hopefully in two years, your case will be there. Right, we'll see. Okay, I'm going to stop. We'll see. We'll and, see. Uh, and I guess we have time, oh, five about like five minutes five for minutes. Uh, questions or comments, etc. Thank you so much. Yeah. I appreciate the question. Oh, yeah, and you may have a response. I don't know. You know, we only have five minutes left, but maybe I'll work it in. So, <laughs> questions for you from the, uh, from, the, from the students. Let me unplug this. It's probably going to be really annoying for you guys. It's flipping on and off. Questions. Don't be shy. I'm doing thing, and I answered you currently. Yes. I do have a question. It might be more for Crash, but I think you have a few problems as well. Uh, Crash, you talked about 3D printers then being able to institute some sort of DRM to lower their secondary liability. I'm having difficulty differentiating between a 3D printer and a Sony Betamax machine. Because there is a substantial non infringing use for a 3D printer, just as there is for a Betamax, but the Supreme Court says it's perfectly fine to sell Betamax or not yeah. secondary reliable. Well, so, right, and, right, so we have, right, we have this case, right, the Supreme Court case saying essentially uh, you can sell VHS machines even though they facilitate copy. Uh, and, um, and, and so I think that fits in here. Uh, that, the problem with that case is it's now approaching, is it 30 years old? Uh, and the difference in technology today is that, um, is that 3D printers are linked to, uh, to uh, which I would call extremely high-powered computers, uh, which which now offer right. It, it, it's really technologically easy for them to block or allow something. Uh, and where, whereas back in 1980, uh, they right the there was no feasible mechanism for someone making a test to to encode within it saying you know you may not you know don't 
uh, don't copy Star Wars. Right? You couldn't code that in originally. Now you can. Technology, that new capability, uh, means that there is the potential for um, uh, right. The fact that they could could avoid causing harm means that now, once they know they are causing harm, they probably have to stop. I have nothing to add to that. Excellent answer. There's a question in the back. Sir, um, I was just going to ask. There's nothing to stop Congress from just saying there's design limitations on the sorts of guns that you can put out there. Like we already mentioned you for automatic weapons or like a design for automatic weapons on the internet. Sure. So, so, so the question, if you couldn't hear it, was could Congress simply put limitations on the design? So, if Congress had simply said that all guns have a certain quantity of metal, this one's like the firearms act, I think that's fine. Um, but I think there are some Second Amendment constraints. Um, the language he, uh, Professor Crouch quoted was the dangerous and unusual weapons. Um, uh, this weapon is neither particularly dangerous uh, and it's a handgun. Um, granted, it's made of plastic, but there have been guns made of plastic for a very long time. Uh, 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 so it's not particularly novel. The novelty here is that you can create it fairly easily. Um, uh, but in any event, there's not much movement in Congress to actually ban these sorts of guns. Uh, so instead, the State Department is using this backdoor approach with this, this really obscure arms control regime, which, which if you want to go into the statutory administrative law claims, is, is nowhere close to doing what they say it does. Um, but this is really a backdoor attempt to regulate what Congress has. Maybe one more question? We actually probably should go ahead and No more questions. Yeah. Thank you all so much for your attention. And uh, if you have questions, please come up and ask me afterwards.